for him to use the people of Ukraine as a pawn in his scheme to save the carbon tax is a, is a level of cynic- cynicism that we didn't even expect from that prime minister, Mr. Speaker. Welcome back to Northern Perspective, everyone. I'm Cypher. And I'm Fox. By popular vote, we are back to the fall economic statement, but we start with the NDP getting a taste of their own medicine. Let's take a look. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, the the minister mentioned in her remarks that we're facing a housing crisis, certainly a significant housing shortage. She talked about how Canada has the lowest... uh, debt in the G7. She talked about how it has the lowest deficit in the G7. The government of the Bank of Canada said that spending on housing wouldn't be inflationary. Now, she announced some measures today for social housing, but they don't start until 2025, 2026. Triggered the Conservatives. The Honourable Member of Rising on a Point of Order. My point of order, Mr. Speaker, is that there isn't a question in this long, rambling, pointless speech. All right, well played. <laughs> well played. So for those of you that uh, didn't watch our video yesterday, when Pierre was doing the lead up to his question, this exact guy, Mr. Blakey, rose on a point of order complaining that Pierre was making a speech and wasn't actually asking a question. <laughs> so it's great to see him get some... Uh, Get some of his own medicine by the Conservatives making the exact same point. This is a question and comment. The Honourable Member from Elma Transcona still has the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I am tempted to start from the top, but I won't, because I do want to get to the point, which is that for a government that's saying they're in a good fiscal position, and with the Bank of Canada that says spending on housing is not inflationary, the question is, why are the new investments for social housing put off to 2025? Good question. Yeah, the Honourable Minister of Finance and Deputy Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank the member for Elmwood Transcona for his commitment to Canadians for his hard work on housing. Mr. Speaker, we absolutely understand the urgency of investing in housing. We need to invest in housing today, and we need to have a plan to continue investing in housing going forward. I am very pleased that our investments in housing right now include supporting the development of co-op housing, of lifting the GST from new co-op developments, along with providing new funding to get them built. As someone who has lived in a co-op, I can tell you, this is one of the best forms of affordable housing that creates great community at the same time. The Honourable Member from Kitchener Centre on a brief question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that the, uh, that the Finance uh, Minister recognizes we are in a climate crisis. At the same time, she needs to know that oil and gas companies are gouging Canadians at the pumps. 47 cents of every dollar of inflation is from corporate profits. Why would they not apply the Canada Recovery Dividend, which they already did, to banks and life insurance, to big oil in the fall economic statement? <laughs> Answer from the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance. We absolutely understand the urgency of climate action. That is why I'm delighted that today we are publishing a timeline for our investment tax credits that are so essential to Canada's green transition and to our economic plan that is creating jobs today and jobs tomorrow. Yes. I have a brief question from the member from Etobicoke Centre. Yay, tax credits. That means more money being spent. 
It's all she knows how to do. Yeah, but what was that question from the Green Party? Like, I I hate the Green Party. They're a single issue party. And and I cannot take them seriously when they are against nuclear energy but claim to be for the environment. Yeah, they're they're more fanatical than, than Stephen Jibo. Which you may think, well, how is that even possible? Well, just look at look at how they position themselves. Um, Mr. Speaker, over the past, in the past number of budgets, we have seen uh, the federal government commit significant funding to support the people of Ukraine in their fight against gen- uh, Russia's genocidal invasion. And so my question to the Minister of Finance is, um, we, we just saw the Conservative Party MPs vote against the Canada Ukraine Free Trade Agreement, basically voting against support for Ukraine. Could the minister clarify what is this government's position on support for Ukraine? Okay, excellent question. And the seals keep clapping. I don't understand. I thought that this question, like this question period, this 10 minutes of time, was for the opposition to ask questions of the finance minister, not for the Liberal Party to ask questions of their own finance minister. Right, that they would already know the answer to. They're just doing it for the cameras. Yeah, this is a scripted question, 100%. 100%. And you see how they're like, oh, you know, the Conservatives voted against it. Yeah, and they're like, excellent question, excellent question, that's atrocious. 100% 100 for the cameras. brief answer from the Minister of Finance and Deputy Prime Minister for Canada. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition described our measures to build new homes for Canadians as disgusting. I'll tell you what I will describe as disgusting. The failure by the official opposition to support the country which is fighting the world's fight wow. right now right for on. democracy. Right So her answer was just to crap on the conservatives? Yep. Nothing to do with the fall economic statement. What is going on? This is a clown show. Yep. All you need is some jugglers and a high wire act and uh, the circus would be complete. Mr. Speaker, as we stand here today and witness the, the, the misery that is visible across this country. It's hard to forget how good things were only eight years ago when this Prime Minister took office. Let me review the hard facts. Never before has a Prime Minister in, in, inherited in a richer legacy. Inflation and interest rates were rock bottom. Taxes were falling faster than at any time in Canadian history. The budget was balanced. It took 25 years to pay off a mortgage, not just to get a mortgage. Crime had fallen by 25 percent, so low that many small town folks actually left their doors unlocked. Remember those good days when you could leave your door unlocked? No one would do that today. Our borders were secure. Housing costs, half was it what it does today. Take-home pay had gone up 10% after tax and inflation. The New York Times had calculated that Canada's middle class was for the first time ever richer than America's middle class. All this despite a once-in-a-lifetime financial crisis in the U.S. and wars in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and yes, Ukraine. Funny how those wars didn't cause inflation when Prime Minister Harper was leading our economy. But when, yes, it's true that when this Prime Minister took office, Canada was rich, affordable, and safe. Eight years ago, yes, it was. Rich, affordable, and safe. And it's true. 
the, well, the very wealthy had not done particularly well. In fact, their share of the economy had shrunk under the, in, during the Harper years. Now the wealth concentrates among the very, very rich. Exactly. And that is because inflationary policies always help the richest people. Yeah. When government concentrates wealth in the hands of politicians and bureaucrats, they give it to the most politically influential people, and the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And now we're seeing the biggest gap ever between rich and poor. And a middle class, he promised to help the middle class, he has demolished the middle class. Mr. Speaker. That is the reality. Inflation, after hitting 40-year highs, is back on the move. The economy is now shrinking. And if you add in per capita terms, it is plummeting, Mr. Speaker. In fact, GDP per, per person is actually smaller than it was six years ago. This has never happened, Mr. Speaker. Canada's growth is now projected to be the worst in the OECD between now and 2030 and the worst for the next four de decades, according to the OECD. That's out of 40 countries. It now takes 25 years to save up for a down payment in Toronto. You used to pay off a mortgage in that time. Since this Prime Minister has taken office, Families have stretched out the terms of their mortgages to 90 years. Today, the minister bragged that she's going to create this charter, which will, people are supposed to be grateful about this, will allow them to stretch out their mortgages longer so that you can now have a 100-year mortgage. Wow, and now we're supposed to thank them. Wow, what wonderful news. I imagine she'll send it out in the mail so people can open their mailbox and find out that their great-great-grandchildren will still be paying off the mortgage on their home. Canadian homes now cost 50% more than in the United States of America. In fact, you can now buy a 20 bedroom castle in Scotland for a lower price than a two bedroom in Kitchener. Vancouver is now the third most unaffordable housing market in the world when you compare median income to median house prices. Worse than New York City, than Los Angeles, Chicago, London, England, even Singapore, a tiny island with 2,000 times more people per square kilometer than Canada, has more affordable housing. And Tor Toronto is rated by UBS to be the worst housing bubble in the world. If we had, th if we had even imagined to say such a thing out loud eight years ago, people would have laughed. But today, it is the reality, and they're not laughing. They're actually crying. In fact, the government promises all of a sudden, after eight years, we should build, we should promise, we should believe in their multi-billion dollar promises to build homes. They built fewer homes last year than were built in 1972, 50 years ago. And that was at a time when our population was half of what it is today. So we're building fewer homes now that we have 40 million people than we built when we had 22 million people, Mr. Speaker. And no wonder we have this new phenomenon of middle class working homeless people. We've never seen this before, but now we have nurses, electricians, carpenters living in parking lots. Things, something they couldn't even imagine in Halifax, in the, your province, Speaker. The province, ironically, of the housing minister, there are 30 homeless encampments in one city. This would have been unimaginable. And now they expect us to believe that this time they mean it, that their billions of dollars of new spending are going to change what the billions of dollars they've spent over the last decade have caused. And that is the worst housing crisis in Canadian history, perhaps the worst in the, in the world today. This Prime Minister has doubled our national debt, adding more debt than all of the previous prime, 22 Prime Ministers combined. He continually tells us that there are no consequences for that debt. Well, the consequences are now becoming clear. Next year, the government will spend more on debt interest than it does on health care. So instead of the money going True. to doctors and nurses, it will go to bankers and bondholders in Manhattan and in London, England. Another transfer of wealth from the working class to everybody out, to the, to the wealthiest people, from the working class to the smirking class, Mr. Speaker. We see the social breakdown that this has brought in our communities, with crime raging out of control. Shootings are up 101 percent 
across Canada over the last eight years. Drug overdoses, 30,000 of them, Mr. Speaker. Social breakdown is the obvious consequence of the economic breakdown that the Prime Minister has caused. And on what has he spent all of this money? $54 million for the Arrive Can app that we didn't need, didn't work, and could have been done in a weekend by a couple of IT workers. We know that because they did. A couple of IT workers, as a lark, bought a few boxes of pizza and a case of beer and redesigned the entire Arrive Can app in a weekend. And it didn't cost them $54 million. Maybe we should send that app to the Prime Minister and call it the Resign Can app, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Okay, that was great. <laughs> I had to stop it there. And we wanted to let that run for, for a while because Pierre was just making point after point after point after point. And it's sad, but it's true. It is sad. Like, I'm sitting here just with this this feeling in the pit of my stomach. Just everything that he's saying is absolutely true. And all the research we've done and in, in the whole time we've been running this channel, all these stats, we have seen time and time and time again. But when he reiterates them like that, all at once, back to back, it really, it makes you feel sick that Stephen Harper did a, an amazing job of running this country and handed it off to Justin Trudeau, who just destroyed everything. He completely destroyed Harper's legacy, completely destroyed the legacy of so many Canadians, so many hardworking Canadians. You know what it feels like? It feels like a dad that, you know, just restored his, his old Corvette his 1960s Corvette, you know, he spent all of this time restoring it, blood, sweat, and tears. And his son comes out, his, his cocky son says, hey, dad, can I take that out for a ride? And he says, sure, just be careful with it. Yeah, I know what I'm doing, dad, it's fine. And then goes out and smashes the thing into a tree and totals it. it it's, it's literally like a dad handing the country over to a child. Because he's treating it as such. He doesn't treat this as work. He, he, he goes on vacations what, what seems like every other week. It's more than any other prime minister in the past. And he, he, he treats this as like a celebrity photo op. He, he, he just loves traveling around, burning all this carbon that he's so against. And he just you know, thinks himself a rock star as he sings Queen in the lobby of a hotel right before the Queen's funeral, making himself look like to be a royal ass. Because he is a royal ass. But above and beyond that, you know, this speech that Pierre just gave is, is incredibly important because it is all true. And, you know, if you have people in your life that you know, despite your best efforts are still intent on voting liberal or even NDP, just show them that clip of Pierre. And ask Be them, what, what has he said in there that's not true? Because it is all true. All of it. Like I, I was in, I was in another province uh, a couple months ago, a province that I had never, ever, ever seen a tent city before. And sure enough, there it was. So this, this is the reality, folks. And most of you listening, you already know this because you see it and a lot of you sadly live it. But it doesn't have to be like this. Well, as Pierre said, it wasn't like this eight years ago before Justin Trudeau and it won't be like this after he's gone. They blew a billion dollars on a so-called green fund. The top bureaucrats say that it, who are involved in it say that it's a money-for-nothing scheme with gross incompetence that reminds them of the sponsorship scandal. The chair of the fund gave 200000 of the money to her own company. Now we find out that the $15 billion they're giving to a single battery plant is going to pay for 1,600, sorry, 1,600 foreign workers. 
1,600 foreign workers, Mr. Speaker. And they don't even have a place to live. There's a housing shortage in Windsor. Now, the Prime, Prime Minister's solution is to spend precious tax dollars on paychecks for people on the other side of the world to come here temporarily, collect the money, and take it back to South Korea. We all love South Korea, great country, but there's no reason why Canadian taxpayers should be subsidizing their paychecks. Yeah. Canadian tax dollars should exclusively go to Canadian paychecks. Yeah. That's common sense. And the Prime Minister, of course, wastes money through missed opportunities. We, we could develop our resources. For example, we could be breaking dependence on the world's dictators. And let's talk about this for a moment. Today, he, he, his party shamefully voted to impose a carbon tax on the people of Ukraine. They, 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 have voted, they have voted to amend the existing Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement, which Conservatives ne negotiated, and which has been a success, to require that both countries have and promote carbon taxes, Mr. Speaker. Exactly the opposite of what the people of Ukraine need. They don't need a carbon tax when they're trying to fight and defeat a war. They need the ability to rebuild their economy, which takes energy. And that's why Conservatives will oppose any imposition of a carbon tax there or here or anywhere around. Did I just hear that correctly, that they're going to be imposing a carbon tax on Ukraine? Yeah, so they're requiring, you know, both countries to have a carbon tax as part of the free trade agreement. People over there are plagued by war. Like, do you honestly think a carbon tax is going to do them any good? That's why this carbon tax is not about the environment. It's not about people. It's not it's it's about money. And anybody who doesn't see that is blind as a bat. And you know what else they did? They voted against an amendment that would allow Canadians to build the arms that would allow Ukraine to win that war. Right. We proposed an amendment to this update of the agreement that would have allowed Ukrainians to benefit from our incredible Canadian workers who produce munitions and equipment, and they voted no. So let's get this straight. They believe that the best way to counter Putin is with a carbon tax. We believe the best way to do it is by breaking European dependence on his energy sector and by providing and, and, and selling great Canadian arms to win the war. Canadians understand that the way that you help a country rebuild is by selling technology for energy. We proposed as well that we would provide both civilian nuclear technology and sell our civilian grade uranium from Saskatchewan to power nuclear plants that would give emissions free electricity to Ukrainians as they have to replace bombed out uh, electricity plants. The Prime Minister did not include that in his deal because he doesn't want affordable energy. He doesn't want the jobs to come back to our resource sector. All he wanted was to try and save his carbon tax. That's just how desperate he is. And in fact, how sick he is on this matter, Mr. Speaker. We all know that he was desperate to save his carbon tax. But for him to use the people of Ukraine as a pawn in his scheme to save the carbon tax is a, is a level of cynic cynicism that we didn't even expect from that Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker. When I'm Prime Minister, we will have a free trade agreement with Ukraine, and that agreement will not include a carbon tax. It will include the ability of us to provide clean Canadian nuclear and natu natural gas to have a strong energy superpower status for Canada and its superior Absolutely. And the, 
the, the, the hypocritical members over there who, who, who pretend they support Ukraine, but then they supported the Prime Minister signing off, sure. signing off on a turbine to go from Montreal to Putin That's so that he could power his natural gas That's pipeline great. and pump that gas into Europe to fund his war. That's the Prime Minister's priority, to give Putin more money selling natural gas. Our priority, our common sense plan, turns dollars for dictators into paychecks for our people in this country. think this debate is going how they expected it to go. Their, their heads are all looking down, and rightfully so, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. It will be a good moment for them to atone for the cynical approach they've taken on this and everything else, and frankly, the misery that they have unleashed in this country. This is the worst time in Canada's history. It, for, for the Canadian people, particularly for the middle class. But the good news is we have a common sense plan that will axe the tax to bring home lower prices, cap spending and cut waste to bring down inflation and interest rates, remove bureaucracy to build more homes so that once again people can afford to rent and pay their mortgages. This will be a country that works for the people who do the work, the common people, the common sense of the common people united for our common home, your home, my home, our Let's bring it on. Oh, Eric. 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 Yeah, Eric. <laughs> wow. Get up. That that was impressive. I, I did not know a lot of those things that Peter just said about Ukraine and how, you know, that there's a carbon tax, like a mutual carbon tax. He's absolutely right. Trudeau is exploiting those poor people. Well, and and the fact that he's he's okay with sending Putin a turbine, <laughs> like, what happened to the embargoes? What happened to the sanctions? The liberals are not supporting Ukraine at all. They're no, they're just again throwing money at it. That's it. This is all they know how to do is is, is throw money at things, and they're not concerned about people. They're not concerned about Canadians. They're just. <laughs> They are concerned about this hill that they intend to die on, which is the hill of climate change and the carbon tax. That's where they are. And Canadians see it. Now, we're not just saying Canadians see it because we're being rhetorical. You see it in the polls. Canadians have woken up. They have woken up to the wokeness that has been destroying this country for the last eight years years you cannot run a country on ideology no and you can't run the, a country based on photo ops but that's what trudeau's been doing and if you if you heard the part earlier where pierre was talking about families that are looking to leverage 90-year mortgages according to freeland's new charter that's scary. And it's not scary for maybe the reason that you think. It's scary because if people start doing that, they become more and more and more reliant and accustomed to that based on how the liberals are trying to systematically change the economic reality of this country. They are trying to change this so that you become completely and utterly 100% totally reliant on the state to exist. And that you're in debt, literally, from cradle to grave. Right. And then you become a slave to the system. No shackles needed. Because we have you by the skin of your debt. And this is the reality that we're dealing with, folks. And I know that you know this because a lot of you have really started to follow this very, very closely. But to what Fox said earlier, this is what you need to show to your liberal friends. Liberal family, have a movie night. Show them this movie. Because they need to see what's actually going on. The vast majority of Canadians that are still voting liberal and still voting NDP don't have a clue. 
They will only have a clue when it comes election period. And the only clue they're going to get is they're only going to listen to their party people. That's it. Well, and that's the thing. The people who are still voting liberal are not affected by this yet. They're not affected by, you know, the threat of losing their home. They're not affected by the opioid crisis. They're not affected by high grocery prices in the fact that they have so much disposable income that spending twice as much as they should on groceries doesn't really hit them in the bank account the way it does the rest of us. Or if they are, all they're hearing is Trudeau saying, oh, well, it's the war. Oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. Pierre made a really good point. So there was wars during the Harper era. Where was global inflation then? Well, and then they'll blame the pandemic. It's not the pandemic. It's these inflationary measures like in the fall financial statement that are ruining this country and making life just impossible for the rest of us. And this is what happens when you have people playing with money that have no idea, no experience and no education on how to run a country and how to run an economy.